I got you. All right, so we are uh, debating and discussing at what point or when is someone justified. And I have 10 minutes, so just real briefly, oh, I do want to go through that this, this what you're seeing is my uh, YouTube channel. You can subscribe. You can call in on the time frame at Friday night at 8 p.m. because I'm not going to convince you in 10 minutes. I mean, we see there's just one individual here that is a friend of Trey's, and she puts the reference of R.C. Sproul and about uh, we're saved by works, but not our own. Our own. So that's what we're going to get into in a little bit. But my point is, a lot of Trace friends are not going to be convinced over the internet. So I want to encourage you to be serious about this. This is heaven and hell. We haven't. He said he hadn't had a debate on heaven and hell or hell, but uh, hell is real, and you need to get into the Word of God and see what it teaches. These are some other videos that I previously made where I actually have the Bible up on the screen and you can watch them and learn the truth from it. Here's Understanding Calvinists, another video on there that I would encourage you to take your time and go watch these videos where even some of his members or friends have called in and you'll be surprised what some of them have to say. Now, earlier, Jeremiah was mentioned and uh, this was a message I asked Jeremiah and this is Trey's friend. And I said, I'm confused. Do you base salvation off of any knowledge? He says, yes. But see, Calvinists believe in predestination. You're elect or non-elect, chosen from the foundation of the earth. So I was kind of surprised that he bases this off of knowledge. And we'll get to that in the question and answers with Trey. He replies back, Jeremiah does. Uh, so faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. I'm surprised that he would actually put this out there about knowing the truth, the knowledge of the truth. And we as newborn babes desire the pure milk of, of the word. If you listen to these guys, they, they say something like this, but then they turn around and say you're totally depraved and you're born in sin and you can't understand the word, but then they give you references like this. That's what I'm talking about. These guys are so confused. You, you listen to them preach and teach and they'll contradict uh, one another. They'll contradict the word of God constantly. And then I asked a Jeremiah question. So can a person be non-elect and learn truth and be elect? He says, what do you mean? A very simple question like that, right? But that's what you're going to get with these individuals. Now, I will play this very briefly if it happens to play. This is one of his callers, uh, friends. Okay. Now, let me, let me start over real quick. believe that a person so I asked the caller, do you, do you believe that you have to confess with your mouth to be saved? These guys are so against doing anything that he actually says no. Listen to what he says. See, he says, no, you don't have to actually confess Romans 10, 9 and 10 with your mouth. I'm not saying if something's physically wrong with you, but they say, no, see that would you work your way to heaven. And you see Jeremiah there, he liked, he put a heart on it. And this was a, this is a blog that some man wrote up explaining away Romans 10, 9 and 10. Why do you have to write a four-page book on one verse and explain it away? Because you believe some Calvinist doctrine. So, I have about six minutes. So, when is a person justified, saved as a Christian? Well, again, John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is truth. First Thessalonians 5, 21 is prove all things. So, that's why if you decide to call in my show, you need to prove what you say. You just can't call in and just say, uh, this or that. You need to give book, chapter, and verse upon what you believe. Now, we see the Bible teaches in many ways. One, Psalm 119, 160 says, The sum of thy word is truth, the American Standard Version. We look at seven causes here for justification. And so when Trey says uh, we're justified by faith, well, I agree with that. But now Trey's going to have to say it's a dead faith because he's going to remove works. So is Trey going to say we're justified by dead faith? When the Bible says we're saved by grace or the blood or works or by the name of the Lord Jesus in the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, or Christ, 
or even knowledge. The Bible teaches there's different things connected with being justified. And when we talk about being justified, we're talking about salvation or remission of sins. So when we look at saving or true biblical faith, the Bible teaches it starts out with faith, a belief. That is the sole foundation to lead someone to obey what God says to do to be justified. A person must repent. Okay, Luke 13, 3, Jesus says that. One must confess. See, we're not going to be like his friend that called in and said, no, if you confess with your mouth, you're working your way to heaven. No, because you would contradict Matthew 10, 32 and Romans 10, 9 and 10. And then one must be baptized into Christ. We see Galatians 3, 27, and, and along with 2 Timothy 2, 1, says that grace is located in Christ. So if a person's going to be saved from their sins, they're going to have to be in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> when we look at definitions or um, defining words, there's here defines faith as the conviction of truth of anything, belief in the New Testament of a conviction or belief respecting man's relationship to God and divine things. A conviction or belief that Jesus is the Messiah or the religious beliefs of Christians. Now Strong's also defines it as a system of faith, meaning what God said to do, we be, to be saved, we must do that, friends. Now we're looking at the definition of justified. Since we're talking about being justified, it is just or innocent, free to be righteous. And that's what the Bible would uh, mean by being justified. And I'm sure Trey would agree with this. <coughs> But in Acts 22, 16, the Bible says, And now why tarest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So friends, if we want to have our sins washed away to be justified, we've got to be baptized. And of course, Trey would deny that. I wonder, in the questions, will he deny confessing? Will he deny repentance? What does one have to do? We're going to see what he says on that. But the Bible teaches that you must be baptized for the remission of your sins. Why? Because you've sinned. Not you're born in sin, so they got, they got all that wrong. Hey, if you guys would watch my YouTube, you'd see towards last week, guy calls in, talks about being born in sin. I read from a book, a manual here, and I'm going to ask him about that. Some about non-elect babies are going to go to hell. And the, and the caller says, well, yeah. I mean, that's what the manual says, the Westminster Confession of Faith says there's some elect babies that are going to go to heaven. Some are going to go to hell. Well, I wonder if Trey would, would agree with his, with his uh, Calvinist friend that calls him. But see, that's what you're getting with all this. this is, it's just mass confusion in the religious world. Mass confusion. So when we look at Romans, 3, 20, uh, Romans chapter 3, 24 through 28, it says, Being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. If you, ever, if you ever notice, the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, friends, you have to be in Christ, whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. So when you read like grace and a redemption that's in Christ Jesus or faith, I agree with all those. But the problem is, and even Jeremiah made about being justified by faith, is they miss the conversion accounts. That's really what it comes down. It comes down to a lack of understanding biblical authority. They don't understand simple hermeneutics of how do we gain Bible authority, friends. The Romans were already Christians. So when Trey comes up with Ephesians and Romans, does he know in the book of Acts where they were converted and how they were converted? We look here at the first gospel sermon. This is the first time the gospel was preached to lost people. So when he goes to Ephesians and Romans, those people are already members of the church of Christ. And it says, so, and it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, do you call out verbally? No. We see what Peter told him to do in Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 38. It says, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They say, you don't do anything. Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Now, Trey here is going to have about five minutes. So I want him to answer 
Acts 2, 38. I want him to answer about being justified by faith alone. Where is that in the Bible? And taking these other passages that are written to Christians and acting like I don't believe grace or the blood of Jesus when I clearly do. All right. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, uh, tr uh, Travis, for that opening statement. All right, Trey, you're up for your five, uh, ten minute opening. Uh, let me know when you're ready, or I'll start my time. I start. Yeah, but I start the time when you begin to speak. All right. Uh, let me fix this little thing right here. All right, I'm ready to go. I didn't even right. prepare a 10 minute opening. I have not even prepared a 10 minute opening because there's so much I want to say. Um, it took Travis about 40 seconds to get on Calvinism because I really don't think he wants to talk about what we're supposed to talk about here. So uh, Marlon, go ahead and put that on the books for a debate with me and Travis. I would suggest everybody to go and uh, look at the, the debate he had with Matt Slick. Um, and Travis just doesn't understand doctrine, um, historical church doctrine, theology, scripture itself. Uh, and we'll show that here in a minute. But put that down. Me and Jeremiah can do it with him and one of his friends um, anytime. Travis talked about all the friends I had calling in the show. I mean, I'm, I have no idea what he's even talking about. Um, I know a few of the guys, but I got a lot of friends out there, I guess. Well, here's what I want you to understand. I spent 18 years in the Church of Christ, preaching, teaching, um, all that. I mean, I, when we built our house, we built a big old two-acre pond. We called it the graveyard so we could baptize people at 2.30 in the morning uh, if we needed to. So all in, I baptized a Baptist preacher one night in a lake. Uh, so whatever Travis is saying, believe me, I said it myself, um, completely get his understanding, and it, it's heartbreaking to me. Um, I want people to know out there that I absolutely love the Church of Christ. I love the people in the Church of Christ. Um, I, it's my people. I have, you know, from my my family, from from cousins, the aunts, the uncles, the brothers, in laws. It's just we come from the Church of Christ, and I love the people in the Church of Christ. There are so many good people in the Church of Christ, and I'll, I will tell you, it, it breaks my heart for those sitting in there who carry such a heavy. Uh, weight on their shoulders because they're trying so hard. They truly do love Christ and Christ alone. And they know when they're reading the Bible, they know that some things just aren't adding up and it's just something's not right. And I love it when they finally do come and see the gospel of Jesus Christ for what it is, the gospel of grace, of faith alone and Christ alone. And as hard as they work in the church of Christ, I mean, they are some hard workers, I'll tell you, because that's, they just are. But when that that weight is lifted off their shoulders. You watch them suckers run then. I love it. And I love seeing them being freed in Christ. Um, you know what, what Travis is talking about, I got a few minutes left. I don't want to get too sidetracked. But it's just word judo. Uh, it's, it's word, scripture, judo. It's proof texting. It's uh, half truths. I'll just tell you, for instance, it's just not, it's not honest. It's, um, it's deceitful. And I, I pray that he's not doing it um, intentionally, I think he really does believe what he says. I mean, because I know this. I know when I was there, I believed it with all my heart. I believed it 100%. No one could have convinced me of it. But thank God that he opened my heart and my eyes to his word. So, Travis, I do think that you really are sincere and genuine. You really think that you're true and, and you're right about what you're saying. I've been there. But I pray that God, and I've been praying since we found out about this debate, that you will um, have your eyes open and see it. And I pray for all those people in the Church of Christ out there who struggle. Am I good enough? Have I made it? Have I done enough? Am I, am I saved? Am I not saved? Do I have to get rebaptized? It's just, it's just heartbreaking, you know. The work, 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 and you put the smile on, and and you know. Now listen, I'll tell you, there's a price to pay to follow Jesus Christ. When you lay it all down, and you you um you come to Christ alone, I promise you, when you get away from the Church of Christ and that doctrine, you're going to lose. Uh, your community, friends, family, possibly. But uh, like Paul says in Philippians, man, it's it's worth it. It, it is just so worth it. And, and and you can pray for those people and and go back and try to try to show some of them just the, the beautiful goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I want to just show you real quick. I got five minutes left of what I'm talking about with Travis. I'm going to show you that Travis doesn't truly believe the Bible. He thinks he does, no doubt. 
he thinks he does, but he doesn't. And, and what happens is when you, tra- when you change definitions of words to make your system work, uh, you can't pass a, you, you couldn't go to a kindergarten class and read a Dr. Seuss book and, and say, look, teacher, I, I, I like the book. I got the book. I read the book. I just don't like the story. So I changed the words to make it fit what I want it to be. You're going to fail the test. You're going to fail the class, much less with God's word. You cannot go in there and start tweaking the word of God because you don't like it or you don't understand it. You know what? There might be some things you don't understand about God. He is infinite. He is eternal. He is omnipotent, all-knowing. We're finite creatures. We live in his world that he created, and he told us how to live in it. We submit ourselves to him and his word, and that's the final authority. So don't listen to me. Don't trust me. Don't trust Travis. Please don't trust Travis. Let's look at this and, and, and see what it is about. Uh, Friday, he did a, um, a hit piece on me and Jeremiah. I mean, uh, he did a show Friday on me and Jeremiah. It was very, I would say, unethical, uh, dishonest, and sad, really. And, uh, but that's what he did. But what he did is he's, try, he's trying to explain to people how you're not born in sin. That's a heresy. That's called the Pelagian heresy. You cannot understand the gospel of Jesus Christ if you think you're born perfect uh, because you don't see how bad you are. And if you don't see how bad you are, you can't see how good he is. So what he does <clears throat> to explain this, he does this. He, he, it's, it's, just, it's deceitful. If you did this in a court of America, if you tell a half-truth in a court, <clears throat> you go to jail for that. The best lie you can hear is the one that has the most truth in it. So if you go and you say, hey, I, I promise to tell the truth, if you don't tell the whole truth, it's not the truth. So here's what he does to, to try to explain when it says that we're born with, a, with this nature, this sinful nature in Ephesians 2. Um, he, he describes it like this. He finds about three dictionaries. He keeps stumbling through it. He finally finds one, right? And he um, says this right here. Let me find it. He shows this. He shows this picture. And he has the, up there it says, by long habit. That's what nature means. See, it's, it's, it's a mode of feeling and acting which by long habit has become our nature. So it's our second nature. It's not that you're born with it. And so it's very convincing to people who follow Travis and listen to Travis and people who don't study on their own because that takes hard work. It takes discipline. So they just listen. They, they listen to somebody who teaches them and, and they, they fall for it. And it's just not fair. It's not good. Let me give you the whole, um, this is the definition he gave right here. But it's too big. Here is, I don't know, if that is that too big? But this is the um no that's fine um is that good? right now you're on your full screen right now trey so okay. you can see it well, yeah. here we go so here's the actual definition he didn't give the whole thing why why wouldn't you give the whole thing because it goes against everything he wants it to be a mode of feeling and acting which by long habit has become nature that's all he says but look by our depraved nature we are exposed to the wrath of god this meaning is evident from the preceding context and stands in contrast with the change of heart in the life wrought through Christ by the blessing and divine grace. Other, C. Meyer, would lay more stress here upon the constitution in which the habitual course of evil has its origin, whether that constitution be regarded with some as already developed at birth or better as undeveloped. It's still there. It's just undeveloped, but it's there. It's your nature. Here's BDAG. Here's the most accurate, good one. It says this condition or circumstance determined by birth, natural endowment, condition, or nature, especially as inherited from one's ancestors. In contrast, it's not the status or the characteristics that are required after birth. No, no, no. This is what you inherit. This is your nature. But do you see? It's all about words here. And when you change the definition of words, when you proof text all around the Bible, man, you can confuse people, especially if you don't know the Bible. But the thing is, I used to teach what Travis teaches. I used to believe with all my heart what Travis believes. And I've been praying for Travis. I wanted to say every night since I found out about this debate, but there's been nights I hadn't. But I pray to God that not only him, but whoever's watching this from the Church of Christ, please look at the Word of God. Look at it and watch. You're going to see. I'm going to show you. He's not ever dealt with somebody like this who has been behind the curtain of where he's at. You know, he stayed with Matt Slick, and there's nothing I'm going to tell him that Matt Slick didn't tell him theologically. But I know some things that Matt Slick doesn't quite understand. Most people, when he starts getting into context of things, they were like, man, this guy doesn't understand the context. So they try to give him context. But I know he doesn't care about context. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to hold him to his own standard of Bible reading and Bible study and his own beliefs. I'm going to hold him to his own standard. And you're going to see how he contradicts himself everywhere he turns. And so 
I think that's about all I have, but here's the deal right here. Remind them not to quarrel about words. It only hurts the hearers. This is why we have to be very careful. I've been asked to get on two other podcasts with two Church of Christ preachers, and I wouldn't do it because they would not define terms. They would not agree to some definitions because if they did, it would shatter their whole belief system. And so we're going to do this tonight. I've got some questions for uh, Travis. And I just want to expose him for not believing God's word and hold him to his own standard. I'm not going to do any tricks. I'm telling him right now. I'm holding you to your own standard, and we'll see how well you do. But um, that's all I got. All right, guys. Thank you so much. All right, so now we're going to transition to rebuttal rounds. And once again, Travis, you're up for your five-minute rebuttal. Um, I don't know. You're still. It looks like you're still sharing your screen, uh, uh, Travis. There you go. All right. All right, cool. So you're up for your five minute rebuttals now. So uh, I will begin. I will start your time when you begin to speak. All right. Well, I did take note of some things of Trey mentioned. Uh, school's calling, of course, perfect timing. Uh, well, he said he, he didn't know any any of the callers, and then he actually turned right around and said he knew some of them. So that's one contradiction. He, he says, just like what Matt says, he says, you don't know Calvinist doctrine. That's what they always say. You see, when you read it from their own books, it's kind of like, really? Stop, make, stop saying I don't know it and actually give an example of when I did misrepresent. Because, see, I don't want to misrepresent but you can't just say you don't know or you misrepresent. You have to get very specific and show how. And that's what Matt Slick did. That's what they always do. They say, you don't know. You don't know. When you read it from their own manual, you have them call in. You play exactly what they say, and they say, you twist my words. And it's the exact words coming out of their mouth. It's kind of it's kind of pointless if you don't want to be honest with what the scriptures teach. But I'm hoping that some people at their churches actually want to go to heaven and they're not so attached to Trey and Jeremiah. They actually want to uh, follow Jesus and be a Christian. See, they always say they give God the glory. But then he, he goes to his church. It's called the Parish Church and the 12-5 Church. And so they always say they give God, God the glory. But they name it after some, some uh, thing that's not even in the Bible. Not even uh, Christ Church. Christ died for it, Acts 20, 28. Again, he says, I was dishonest. No proof. Nothing. I mean, he he put a picture of me actually giving a definition from Thayer's, and right above it is the definition that they would want to use. And if you go and watch it, you'll see what I showed the caller. The context was they were walking of this world. And again, trace 10 minutes. I know I spent a lot of time promoting uh, you guys to call and ask Bible questions because I'm not going to convince you guys. I live in Tennessee. You guys are watching this all over the United States. And you, and you could care less because a lot of times people are just, they, they have a relationship with their pastor or the way they were raised. They don't care. So I'm actually looking for those that want to seek after God and want to do what the Bible says. So that's why you can call me. You can actually, I don't scream my calls. I don't make any money. I don't ask for money. You, if you have a question, you can call. And that's exactly what those callers did. Those callers were the ones that got off on born in sin, really, and pushing that. And they had some, they were very nice. I don't know if they go to his church, but they, they were very respectful. And, and but when you get to typing back and forth on Facebook and, and on social and these chat rooms, that's pointless. You see, my program, you can call in and you can tell that I'm not being mean and you don't have to be mean. And we can just, I put the Bible up on the screen because that's what we're going to be judged by. So, um, so he spent most of his time actually just talking about born in sin and nature. And the subject, again, he wants to say, put that on the record, but he didn't even really bring up anything about the Bible about being justified. Uh, he just says, believe in Christ and trust in Christ. But he didn't bring up any scriptures about the Word of God. He didn't even touch Acts 2, verse 38. Where did I lay my Bible at? He didn't, even, he didn't even touch Acts 2, 38, where it clearly shows you need to repent. They said, what do we do? You need to repent and conjunction be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. That means by his authority. See, Trey says, oh, don't believe me and don't believe him. Well, I'm actually giving you the Bible. I, I could share my screen right here if, I don't, if it don't take too much time, and I'll just 
share this and see what I have here. The first gospel sermon in Luke 24, 47, it says, In the repentance and remission of, shen, remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And um, Peter, I, I, I need to update that, but Peter actually preached the death, burial, and resurrection. They say, what do we do? And he told them to repent and be baptized. Uh, Trey might want to say that's because of. See, you can call in. You can ask me that, and we'll study it, because in you know, five minutes, I can't go through everything. Five minutes just goes like that. But again, uh, Matthew 26, 28, says, for the remission of sins, the Greek word ace there, it means it into, in order, to have your sins washed away. You see that? 1 Peter 3, 21, look at this. Peter, inspired, says, baptism doth also now save us. Trey says, no, you don't have to be baptized. Jeremiah says, no, because they're Calvinists. They have been brainwashed with the Calvinist doctrine that you can't read about in the Word of God, and they think they're teaching the truth. And I just really wonder if they actually know better and they're just doing it for spite, teaching false doctrine. John 3, 5, Jesus says you must be born of water. They want to change that. He says we change terms. No, he says that that's ambionic fluid. See, he wants to change it. it says water. That's all the time I got, friends. All right. Thank you so much, Travis, for the five-minute rebuttal. All right, Trey, you are back up for your five-minute rebuttal. Mm, all righty. Well, Travis, again, it goes down to, uh, it just comes down to uh, definition of words, terms, uh, due diligence, studying, uh, spending some time trying to understand and to study some things. Um, you say that, like you, you told on your show that I don't love God and I don't, I'm not a Christian. I don't love God because the name of my church is the Parish of the Redeemer. So just so you know, maybe you'll accept me as a Christian now, I guess. I don't know. But the parish means church. And whose church is it? It's the Redeemer. Who do you think the Redeemer would be? So it's the Parish of the Redeemer. I don't have a town's name in front of it. I don't have a street name in front of it. It's the Church of the Redeemer. So I'm glad we got that cleared up. Um, so where, where to even start? John 3, 5 is not talking about baptism. I'm, I'm looking forward to him and to the cross-examination to really talk about these things. I'd love for him to go to John 3, 5. I'm looking forward to 1 Peter 3. Um, I know everything he's going to say. Um, you know, so I, I don't really know what to tell you. When you get to Acts 2, 38, you, you just, you have to understand the atonement of Jesus Christ, which you do not understand. I don't believe some, from hearing, hearing you, Travis, not, I'm not just guessing here. From hearing your uh, debate with uh, Matt Slick and just some of your shows, you don't understand the doctrine of the atonement, what actually happened at the cross of Jesus Christ. Um, we can get into that in a minute in the cross-examination. But are you saved by faith? Oh, my goodness. The whole Christian religion is the doctrine of faith alone in Christ alone. The definition for a Protestant evangelical is it's a transdenominational, worldwide transdenominational religion that believes that people are so saved solely by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So outside of that, once you add things into it, you're either Mormon, you're Jehovah's Witness, Seventh-day Adventist, Church of Christ. These are restoration movements uh, in America. You're, you got Catholicism, which Church of Christ and Catholicism, basically same thing, just not all the, the history, of course. Um, um, Church of Christ started in 1811. Um, now, obviously, he, he'll say no to that. But you know, influenced by Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon had this uh, this idea that you can come to things with no bent whatsoever, that you're not swayed one way or the other. You have a clean slate of a mind. Just give me the Bible. And they, they came up with this creed that we speak where the Bible speaks, we're silent, we're silent. This is where you get the idea. I don't care what he says. That's just man's opinion. That's just man's opinion. But you don't realize you're contradicting yourself every time you go to church and you hear somebody speaking. That's man's opinion. Listen to Travis. It's man's opinion of interpreting the scriptures. I'm going to show you very clear. I'm just going to make it clear that Travis does speak where the Bible does not speak, and he is not silent where it is silent. Um, yeah, so Acts 238, we can talk about that in cross-examination. Looking forward to all of this stuff, but I do want you to know the parish means church. The Redeemer, that's Jesus, it's his. Um, and I don't know what to tell you, that I thought that was funny about the not being mean on your show. And anybody, please go watch his show, and y'all tell us what you think. But I'm ready to get into the cross-examination time. So 
I'm good to go, Bubba. You ready? Jack? All right. Thank you both for the uh, rebuttals. And so now we're just we're we're going to do just that. We're going to get into the cross examination portion of debate. Once again, the favorite part of every debate is the cross examination. I know this will be very fun. So once again, we're going to have a total of 40 minutes. Both parties will get 20 minutes each to ask questions. Um, once again, if you can answer the question with just a yes or no, please do that. And if you need to give a little bit more information, let's try to make it right to the point and, and straightforward. All right. That's it. Travis, you're up first to cross examine Trey for 20 minutes. All right. Hey, Trey, does the Bible teach that, uh, that we are saved by faith or justified by faith only? Does it directly say that? That we're justified by faith? Yes. No, I said, does the Bible say directly, directly, uh, you can read it, that we're justified by faith only? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me show you. I'm getting the wrong, I got too many computers here. Uh, where do you want to go? You want to go to Romans 3? Let's go to 4. Let's go to 4. So, you know, Marlon, you basically, I'm saving said some more you, right there. He said you might want to answer if you can, yes or no. So it's a pretty simple question. Well, I said yes, and then you asked again. So I said yes. Uh, did you ask me to show you or what? Well, I don't think you heard me uh, clear. I said, does the Bible say directly? Like, can you actually read directly that the Bible says we're saved by faith only, only, only? Because uh, you're, you're doing the, it doesn't say faith alone. You're going to go to James 2. So go ahead and go to James 2. Because, yeah, it doesn't, okay, it, so. it says you're saved. We're justified by faith apart from works, apart from anything else. We're saved by faith apart from anything else. So just reasoning in context, see, this is the, the deal with context. And this is where you're going to get caught here when you go to James 2. I'm just warning you right now. But you're going to do it. Well, you can't well Marlon, he's, he, you're, you're taking a little much my time there, Trey. So uh, to answer it, uh, you said yes, but it doesn't say faith only, and that's what I'm asking directly. It doesn't. You cannot open up the Bible and read that we are saved by faith only. And so a, a simple no would have been uh, fine with that. So does the Bible say directly that we are justified by works and not by faith only? Regardless of your view of the context, does the Bible say that? Regardless of context, just remember that. Uh, okay, yeah, okay. You're going to go to James Regardless 2, says you're justified of, by works, not by faith. Regardless of context, you're right. You're right. Regardless of context, okay. yes. Okay, because Regardless you're going to say that's justified before men, and we can talk about that a little bit because I didn't know man saved us. But uh, So uh, real quick, too, just to get off on the Calvinists, am I one of the elect, Trey? Uh, I don't know. So Okay, am I saved right now? About, now, I believe you preach a false gospel and you're at war with the, the center doctrine of Christianity. So I'm lost. Yeah, you think I'm lost, right? So let's just be clear. You think I'm lost, correct? You think Jeremy well, I'm the one lost? who gets asked questions right now, really. So am okay. I lost? Yes, I believe you believe a false gospel, a gospel of works, and it's the okay. Galatian heresy. Faith plus something else equals no salvation, according to okay. Galatians chapter 1. Yeah. So if you convince me, can I actually change my mind and become one of the elect and become saved? No, again, you do not understand what the elect is. I would like for you, I'll, okay, I'll what, ask you because I'm not going to, you. Okay. So no, so no, what, I can't. I cannot is the elect, you anything. Is the elect meaning that the, those people are saved? No, the elect are not saved yet. Let me show you a scripture for that. Oh, they're not saved yet. Okay. Can so show you not, the elect are not saved from the foundation of the world. No, they're elected from the foundation of the world. They're chosen. Okay, so so you can actually become saved later on, even though you're one of the elect and lost at that moment. Thomas, I mean uh, Travis Thomas, you don't understand election let me read you second timothy well that's 2. why i'm asking you to explain it i'm trying i'm trying okay so second timothy 2 paul says this let's think through it he says therefore in verse 10 second timothy 2 10 therefore i endure everything for the sake of the elect okay so he's enduring everything for the sake of the elect that they who's the they the elect 
also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus, meaning that there are elect people out there, and he's going to endure all this stuff that he's going through so that they, the elect, will obtain, obtain their salvation in Christ Jesus. Like Paul, do you think Paul was the elect? Do you think Paul, the apostle, was elect by God before the foundation of the world? Okay. Uh, just real quick. Give the first account where someone was preached the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection. Where, where uh, was that at? Well, I would say it was the old ladies who came up to the tomb, the empty tomb, and went back to the apostles and said that he rose from the dead. Okay, so would you agree yeah, or disagree? Actually, well, well disagree I with disagree that? with that because you're actually saying that the death, burial, and resurrection had a beginning before even Luke said it started in Jerusalem. Okay. So you said in your video that we're saved by works, the work of God, right? You said we're saved by works, the work of God, right? People can go back really and listen, listen to, to you, but you... Huh? Go, let, me, let me go ahead and... Um, you're asking me a question, I'll answer it. Don't ask me a question, yeah. you answer it for me. Here's the deal. I said on that video that you totally misrepresented because it it's just piecemeal together. It's, it's just, it's like proof texting a video. It's not taking it in context. I said that we're saved by works, but it's his works, Christ's work, Christ's finished work on the cross. His perfect life is what saves us. It's his works, his righteousness that we hang on to, not our own righteousness. So are we saved by works? You better believe we're saved by works, but it's the work of Christ, not the work of Christ and me, not the work of me. It's the work of Christ that he did and he accomplished on the cross for our sins. Okay. So in Colossians 2, 11 and 12, it defines and shows that baptism is actually a working of God. The English Standard, I believe, says powerful working. King James says operation. So would you agree that baptism is actually when God is doing the working? No, not in baptism. No, this, you're again, does context matter? Or we, or you said earlier, disregard all context. Is that still applying no, to this I said as well? On, on James, on the on the one James, because you, you're going to go okay. into about how it's before men. So I'm just trying to get. No, people I don't to think see I will. Exactly what I, listen, I told you earlier I'm not going to go into context with you. I'm not going to do that. I okay. Say what you said on the I'm question saying. and answers. Yeah, I'm. I'm not going to do that. Okay. Do you know what uh, I guess a synecdoche is? Yeah, this is your, uh, yeah, the synecdoche is where it's like, it means two different things. Go ahead and explain it for those who don't completely understand, and you're going to go, go ahead. Okay, so I do want to explain that about a synecdoche. It's a, it's a part that stands for the whole, so like in Acts 19, when they said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, we understand that biblical belief uh, would imply Receiving the Holy Spirit and baptism. So I didn't understand. I just want to make sure you understood what a synecdoche is. Well, so it's was, just a, was it's Adam, a convenient word game. What was what law was Adam under? Uh, don't eat of the tree. Okay, so he was under a law. But that's synecdoche. Let me let me just oh, go ahead. You still get to ask questions. Uh, what does uh, what does law show? What does law show? What do you mean? What does law show? Yeah. What does what does the point? What is the point of law? What does it show? Law shows the character of God. The law of God shows the character of God. It describes the character of God and the image of God. And it's okay, seen perfectly that, in you, Jesus Christ. Would you agree to that? It shows sin. Well, the law was given to give us the knowledge of sin. Okay. Romans three. The law is perfect, holy, and good. It's beautiful. Okay, so you, you've said it too before that there are some members of the Church of Christ that uh, they believe faith, repentance, confessing, and baptism, but they are actually saved. Is that true? Yeah, I think that they have their faith is in Christ Jesus and Christ alone. There are people in the Church of Christ. I think you believe there's people not Christians in other denominations from what I've heard you say before, but I do believe that there are Christians in the Church of Christ. I just think they carry a heavy yoke of works on them because they don't quite understand the things that, that they're seeing in Scripture. It's not making sense to them, and they're just burdened by it. And uh, 
Yeah. So okay. yeah, I would say that there's definitely some Christians in the Church of Christ. Okay. But I guess I'm not one of them. I'm lost. Well, you're at war with the, the main tenet of Christianity, Travis. I mean, it's just a historical fact. Okay. I guess just it is what it is. Okay, yeah. so uh, since you're you're stating that we're saved Biblical by fact. faith alone, is that right? You believe we're saved by faith mm -hmm. alone? Okay, uh, so now by James grace alone, through that. faith alone, uh -huh. by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for what, what the does glory alone of mean? God alone. What does nothing alone else? mean? <clears throat> it means nothing, nothing else. else. I'm saved by grace, okay. by, in, through, okay. right? I ask you what. Well, I asked you what it was. Oh, you, you answered it. You said it, nothing else. So it's kind of, uh, to me, it's a little bit of an oxymoron statement when you say faith alone, then you turn right around and add something else. You know, so just something to think about for the viewers. To no, you, so let, me, let me get you to think about that clear. Look, I'm saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, okay. to the glory of God alone. It's not just yeah, we heard you. We heard not, you, Trey. Da, 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 da. Well, think about it. I want you to okay. think about it. and It's not saying what you think it's saying. It's okay. But they all heard you say alone again, but that's okay. Then what order would you say that this is? Love, confessing, faith, baptism, or penance when one comes to obey God? Well, is there a certain order that a person will have to become a Christian, to be saved, to be justified? To be just the order again was, yeah. The order again was would one right love in. God, love God, confessing, have faith, baptism, repentance. What is the order that one would have? So it's love, confessing, faith, to, baptism, to repentance. be a Christian. Is there a certain? Yes. Well, I would say the Bible says in Romans three that there's no one good, no not one, no one seeks after God. No one has understanding. Uh, the repentance is granted by God in 2 Timothy 2. So God grants the repentance. The faith is given by God. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not your own doing. It's, it's a gift of God. So he, because of that, get, puts the love of God in our hearts. I'll show you that in Colossians. Okay. So all, right. well, all of that is of God. Question, so cause... repentance, baptism are yeah. what Christians do. That's just the outworking of what a changed heart does. God takes out okay, your heart of stone and gives you a heart of flesh and makes you obey him with the spirit. Okay, so there's there's not really, I guess, an order. But John 12, turn your Bible over to John 12, would you? John 12, 42. Well, Let me ask you a question about John 12, 42. Yeah. Okay, are you there? Mm hmm Okay, it says... Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many of them believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. Do you believe, mm -hmm. since you say uh, faith alone is enough, do you believe these people were saved? Uh, there's a, I have a couple issues with you here, Travis. But I will answer your question, but I'm going to show you here in a minute. Uh, the next time you ask me anything in John, I'm going to show you the major issue I have with you taking from my book of God's word and, and, and John. But I would have you turn, because if you, if you care about context, you, you answer this right here. Go to 1 John 5 and read verse 1. Can you do that? No, I'm asking the question. You're eating up time. So it's a kind of a simple question. Do you believe they were saved? Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. And it says 43, yeah, for they, they didn't loved have true, the glory. They didn't trust him. They had the, they believed it. Yeah, they believed it. But demons believe and shudder, right? So they didn't have true faith. Okay. They didn't have true belief. They didn't truly trust. By definition, the word believe, you know. Um, Do you know the Greek word you used right there? It. What's the Greek word in John Is 12, 42? Okay. Okay. Right here. So if that's the that's the that's the same Greek word maybe you would use uh, in Ephesians, right? Ephesians two. Mm -hmm. But these okay. people didn't have saving faith. They didn't have they didn't, okay. they didn't have a faith they truly trusted. They believed so faith like alone was demons. Suffice, 
surprised. Do you believe that demons really believe? In well, trust? I'm not the one that I'm not the one that hosts well, the complete faith reliance. Online. Yeah, I know. Okay. We'll find that out very clearly. Okay, if if someone asked you what must I do to be saved, would you tell them the same thing that Peter said in Acts two thirty eight, or the same thing that Ananias told Saul in Acts twenty two sixteen? If you wouldn't, why not? Yeah, I would tell them. To, uh, so if somebody just came up to me and said, "What?" If, they, if someone came to you to and said, "What must I?" Yeah, I've said, what must I do to be saved? Would you tell them the same thing that was said in Acts 2.38 and Acts 22.16? Well, here's the deal. If somebody came up to me and says, what must I do to be saved? I'd say, hey, let's sit down and let's, let's talk about this for a while. Let me explain to you who God is and who you are and what he's done in his uh -huh. son, Jesus Christ. You know what I'm saying? So I wouldn't just go, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. No, I wouldn't just okay, say but that. Now, I would sit down and study. Now, them. after you tell them about, after you tell them about Jesus... And if they said, "What do what do I need to do now that I've mm -hmm. now that I've put my faith in the death, burial, and resurrection? What must I do?" Yeah. Like they asked, what, would you tell them to repent and be baptized? I would say, put your faith in Jesus Christ, because I understand the context and the Jewish customs of Israel. What's going on there? Uh, what if I told them what they said in the second gospel sermon ever preached in chapter three? Okay. Repent, Would you therefore, say, and turn back, that you, your sins may be blotted out. What if I just told them what they said in the second sermon? Okay. Would what, you, so you do? Are you are you are you affirming that one must repent now? This what no, that's what Christians do. If somebody truly has a heart change, so here, this is what you need to understand. If God has taken out your heart of stone and given you a heart of flesh, and He's put His Spirit in you, this is Ezekiel thirty six. He has put your His Spirit in you that causes you to walk and follow his rules and his statutes and obey him, he is the spirit who causes you to do that, okay? Yeah. So if someone says, man, I wanna give my life to Jesus, like what do I do to be saved? I'm like, man, here's the secret that he don't even know about. If that's truly true in your heart of hearts and you're repentant of your sins because you hate your sin and you love Christ for what he's done, it's because God's already done the miracle in your heart. John 3, 16 okay. through 21 has already happened. The miracle's taking place. So when you said God causes God causes someone to repent. Are you meaning that God forces them? No. I'm saying that if you knew who God okay. was, can I So they, they have their own free, they have their own free will, they can choose to repent or not. Here here's look if you Travis, you go to a Christmas party from your job and you, you take a five dollar trinket gift from somebody at a dirty Santa Christmas party that you don't even like. You're telling me you're gonna turn down Almighty God's eternal salvation when he is all good, all loving, all mercy, all grace, and he and he comes over you and he reveals himself to who, who he really is to you. You think you're going to turn that down? You're not big enough, okay. bud. You will not. Okay. All right. So you, so you just said earlier, oh, he, he uh, doesn't force people, but then you kind of tell him a story that you're not going to turn it down. So he it's does force forcing. people. See, it's okay. That's not uh, what, you can don't you give... who God is. Okay. Can you give me a verse that tells us how to get into Christ? Into. Into Christ. Yeah, into. Oh, let's see here. Let me see. I think I have something here for that. Because I know what you want me to go here. Let's go to Colossians. Let's see where we're at here. No, I'm actually wanting you to go to Galatians 3, 27, Romans chapter 6, 3, and 4. That's how we're baptized into Christ. Right, that's what but, you want. But we have always thanked God, yeah. the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you since, you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this, you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come okay. to you as indeed in the world. All right, disregard it. Bearing fruit it's it's all right, Trey. I'm it's just all right. you, I said, how you coming to Christ. But, Okay, you can take your time. I only right. got a minute and 30. So do you have to be a member of your church to be saved, yes or no? Do you have to be a member like a of my church? No. Yeah. You got to okay. be, be a part of Christ's church. All right. Okay, so that's what I was going to ask. So you do have to be God. a member of the Lord's church, right? Well, Christ right. died for his church. Who did he die for? Okay. 
So you, so you did say you don't have to be a member of your church, but you do have to be, be a member of Christ church. So are you saying, therefore, your church is actually yeah, the, not the universal church? church. Your uni, the universal okay. church. But are you not also, is the universal church also made up of local bodies of believers? No doubt. But you, don't have, you can be a member okay. of a church down the street. Travis, you, you think that every Christian in the world is a member of my church where I go to church? Okay. You said so, do, do so you have to be a member saying of your church local, to be a Christian. Your, your local congregation is not part of the universal church. Is kind of no, my local the congregation, the, the Christians in it, there's, there's, there's sheep and goats in every congregation, right? So the, the Christians in my church are a part of the universal church. Your question was, do you have to be a member of your church, Trey, to be a Christian to go to heaven? Like, no, I think there's Christians in all other denominations okay. everywhere. I can't make out the time. It's too fuzzy. So Yeah, about 12 seconds. You, all right. Well, 12 seconds ain't much to elaborate on. All right. All right. Uh, Trey, you are now for a 20-minute cross-examination of Travis. All right. Here we go. 20 minutes. Let's do this. Okay. What does the definition of faith? What was? Would you agree that this is faith? To be honest, the screen is so blurry I can't read it. But uh, in is my that which evokes trust? Is that which evokes trust? The state of being someone in whom confidence can be placed, fidelity, commitment, a solemn promise to be faithful and loyal. That is the Greek definition of pistis. The Greek what, word what, faith. Uh, what lexicon are you using? That's BDAG. Which one do you want, though? I'll give you anything you want. I got it. You want theirs? Thayer's a strong, like but for some uh, I don't. I don't really have an objection objection to much. But if you pull up Thayer's, it does define also, or Strong's defines also a system of faith, like in Jude three, in ten four. Yeah, that's where you faith. want to use Jude three. So a system. It's a system. Yeah. Well, here's any any definition. It's faith is complete trust and confidence. Okay, that's what faith is. You want to change it into something else. I understand why. Believe, here's believe. To believe to the extent to complete trust and reliance. To believe and Who to have confidence it? in, to have faith in. Who changed what? Who said I changed I it? I changed it. Well, no, you, you said I changed the definition. Faith. Well, because no, you're, you're trying to say Jude 3. Oh, well, I don't want to eat up too much of my time. Listen, you can get, I can get a, a Webster's Dictionary well, you, if you want. You can't say that I don't use the definition when I'm asking you to pull it up for the viewers. Well, I can't pull it up for the viewers. I have it right there. It's faith. It's for the viewers. They can see it. To believe in to the extent of complete trust and reliance. To believe in, to have confidence in, to have faith in, to trust. Faith, trust. So here's my question this. Do you think, okay. here's, here's what baptize means. Baptize means to immerse, right? The action of immersing something or someone in liquid, usually water. Baptism is this right here. It's purification, immersion, okay, religious ceremony designed to symbolize purification, initiation on the basis of repentance, to baptize. So that's, these are just the Greek words of the definitions. So here's what I want to know from you. Justified, yeah. you did have that on your screen. And so I want to put it up there for the viewers. That's justified just as if you never sinned. You're pronounced righteous, okay, in a court of heaven, not the court of law of America. So here we go. You ready, Travis? Are yep. you justified before or after you're baptized? I am justified after I've come in contact with the blood in baptism. Okay, so after you're baptized, Travis, you say that we are then justified. So that would mean I'm not at peace with God until after I'm baptized, correct? Right. Okay, so you cannot have peace with God before you're baptized. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you say you, I come you also, into the access of grace. Do I come into the access of grace before or after baptism? When do I access uh, the grace? Timothy. Right there. Yeah, Second Timothy two before one. Grace is located in Christ. Mm -hmm. So right. So one one has yeah. to be in Christ to be to have the the grace right. the blood of Jesus applied to them. You know how long, how many times um, baptism, the word baptized and baptism is mentioned in the Bible? Uh, what? I'll just tell you really times? Quick. No, it's 96 15. times. 96. And of the 96 times, 21 times you would use it for yourself in the Church of Christ or anybody else would use it. I mean, we would use it. I would use it. 
22% of the time it's used in the, in the sense of baptized in Christ. So 21 times. Faith is mentioned in Romans 36 times just in chapters 1 through 5. So that's how many times. It's just so much bigger. Faith is mentioned in the Bible 539 times. So it's pretty significant. I think what about I'm putting a lot of weight on this baptism. Hold on real quick. So just remember what you said, that we're baptized. When we're baptized, then we're justified. Then we have peace with God. And then we have access to his grace. Could you read that for me? I don't know if you can read on your screen. It's Romans 5.1. If you could look it up for me and tell me what it says. Because 5 comes before 6. I remember one time watching you. You were laughing at somebody when they were trying to explain chapter 10. And you laughed and said that right. 6 comes before 10. Well, I'm just going to let you know that one, and five, 1 through 5 comes before 6. So yeah. what does and, 5, 1 say and 2? Okay. <clears throat> Side note for the viewers, Acts 2, 10 becomes before Romans 1, 5. So therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I already said I believe that we're saved or justified by faith. It doesn't Wait, say alone, um, Trey. I just want to, I want to correct you again. Romans was written in 56 AD and Acts was written in 62. So it's in here, but. The way it was written, Acts came after Romans, just in the historical aspect. So here it says that we have been justified, okay, justified, just as if I never sinned. I've been looked upon just as I never sinned. Here's that definition right there. To pronounce righteous, justified by what? It says faith. So does here's, it say faith only? No. What Does it have anything else on there? Do you see anything? No, it doesn't you got to be silent. Actually, We're silent, right? It doesn't even say the blood. Do you believe in the blood? Well, we can back up. Like I said, one through five comes before six. So, yes, it's it's before that. So we're justified by faith. And because we've been justified by faith, it says we have peace with God. Now, you say, no, we don't have peace with God until after we're baptized. Well, baptism is a different word than faith. The question I would have for you, and then it says we obtain access by faith. <laughs> By faith. So here's the question. Here's what I want you to really sincerely think about. Do you think Paul knew the difference between the word faith and baptism in the Greek word? Did Paul speak Greek? Did, Acts 21, 37, Greek? it makes it very clear that he spoke Greek. Acts 21, 37. He spoke Greek. I would say he probably knows the difference between baptism and faith. Is that a fair assumption? Uh, well, yes, I mean, right. when you were explaining, well, I mean, yeah, when you, when you were explaining about belief and repentance, you also kind of elaborated that repentance is belief. It's two different words. Remember Acts 3? Here, listen, listen. We're going to look here right, real quick. Do you think Paul knows the difference between the word faith and the word baptism? Yeah, and I think yes, that they read... Okay, yes, they, here we go. They read more. So yes, they he does. Read Do you think, so he didn't, he's not about to run out of ink because he could have put, been justified by faith when you're baptized, but he didn't. He didn't mm -hmm. say that. He said, you're justified by faith and you have justified, you're, you're saved. You're, you're deemed righteous. You have access to the grace of God. You're at peace with God through faith in Christ Jesus. And now you want to say this, like, and I'm going to go ahead and, I don't want to go there now. How about this? Does Jesus know the difference between faith in baptism Jesus, Jesus knew the difference? difference he he knew the difference uh and Paul knew the difference between a dead faith and a live faith so oh you're exactly is that right. a dead I'm glad faith? you said that because now listen to me earlier you brought up John 12 42 and that's what I was going to show you in 12 and first John 5 1 it says everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God everyone who believes has been born of God and then first John 229 says if you know that he is righteous you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness have been born of him so if you're going to use earlier john 12 42 this is your word you know, you're trying to proof text people in a corner and i'm going to tell you right now next time you go to john or anything like that again i'm going to stop you i'm going to explain to you why i'm not going to listen to you but john 12 42 it says the pharisees believed and you want to try to make that into something well first john 5 1 says everyone who believes that jesus is the christ has been born of god so my question back to you would be, does the Bible contradict, Travis? Because these two things are very contradictory. This is why context matters. So if we read John 4, 23, Jesus does know the difference between true belief and false. Fake faith, real faith. 
But Jesus here, when he runs what, into what Paul, and my question is this right here. Can you read to me Jesus' uh, commission to Paul in Acts 26? Read verse 18. So he's sending, he's sending Paul out to do something. This is Paul's okay. conversion account in Acts 26. Verse 18. Yeah. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So that, that is one account. Do you, where's the other accounts of the conversion of Saul? So, oh, I can't wait to look at them with you. But it's my turn to ask questions right now. So Jesus says, Paul, I'm sending you out to go preach the gospel mm -hmm. and that people will be forgiven and be sanctified by faith in me. Not by baptism in me. So you want to know how you get in Christ? By faith. By faith. Faith alone. Because they're going to be sanctified by faith in him. Yeah, Are you talking you about faith any alone other word or faith? There? Yeah, I'm talking about faith. Is there any other word? Here's what faith means, Travis. This is the word game. I'm not going to play with you because, see, I played your game. That's what I used to do. So, look, faith. Let me find it here. I had, my, I had another little system here working for me, but I lost it. Um, let me put it up here for people to see. Okay. You do know the next next verse, the next two verses says repent and turn to God. So repentance is in there. It's two different words. Yeah, look what King Agrippa said to him. He says, look, in, sh in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian because you're telling me to believe? Like He's like, he didn't tell you anything about baptism. So back to what I'm saying is, so when the Bible says in Romans 5, and remember Romans 5 comes before 6, that we're justified, saved, set free, deemed righteous by faith, we now have peace with God, and because of faith, we have access to the grace. And this is what Matt Slick asked you. I don't know. I think it was like a year ago, so maybe you've thought of a good answer for it. But when the Bible, when God's Word yeah. says that, you ready for it? Are we justified yeah. by faith when we have faith, or are we not justified by faith when we have faith? Which one would it be? So when, you know, uh, you know the creed and the, the, the creed for the Church of Christ is you speak where the Bible speaks, and you're silent where it's silent. It's going to be hard to do this one. You're talking about Romans 4? Romans 5, 1 and 2. When it says that we're justified by faith, and that word faith has a meaning, and it does not mean baptism. When it says we're justified by faith, does that mean that we're justified by faith when we have faith? Or does it actually mean that we're not justified by faith when we have faith? So are you saying that there, it's saying, therefore, being justified by faith only? Are you adding only? Because I believe we're justified by faith. But you don't, you see this word right here? You see on the screen? I can't. That I can't which evokes your, trust. It's so, it's so I'll read to you. That which evokes trust, state of being someone in whom confidence can be placed, fidelity, commitment, a solemn promise to be faithful and loyal. Faith apart from anything else. This is where we get faith alone, Travis. And, and if it says you're saved by faith, there's nothing else said. Then it's faith. So and faith means did, what faith means. Go ahead. The, the the faith you're talking about is it actually implying a trusting, living, obedient faith in what God says, or is it a dead faith? No, a, a faith in Christ, just like these these Pharisees in twelve forty two, John twelve forty two, says they believed mm -hmm. God, but they didn't do anything about it. Right? They didn't truly trust Him. They didn't make a move. They didn't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. And this is what happens with a lot of people in these fundamentalist groups. They're scared that they're going to lose their identity, their community, their friends, and everything because they know if they leave this group to follow Jesus, it's going to cost them. But the question is, is he worth the cost? And he is worth the cost. But these Pharisees in 1242 did not believe him in that sense where they totally trusted him. They believed it. he was who he said he was, but not to the extent they're going to leave okay. the synagogue, get kicked out of the synagogue. But wait a second, I'm going to answer you here. 1 John 5, 1 says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, has been born of God. Everyone who believes, now you've got to work with some contradictions because if you don't look at the context of things, you're going to find yourself contradicting yourself everywhere because you're going to have to say, well, well, that word believes there, it's a convenient word we made up called synecdoche where we say that it encompasses the whole thing of everything. Well, isn't that convenient? Isn't that convenient? Now you're going to talk to me about words that are not in the Bible? You want to, 
book, chapter, verse. I wanna... See, the standard, okay. I'm going to hold you to your standard. Where is synecdoche in that word in Scripture? It's not. So are yeah. we justified by faith when we have faith, or are we not justified by faith when we have faith? Well, we're— You still haven't answered that. Hey, well, you just— Okay, we're justified by faith, and, and Trey explained it. It's a faith that obeys and trusts, not a dead faith. So you're going you're gonna to obey what God says to do. These were already Christians, right, Trey? When he says you think Romans Paul 5, didn't know that they were Christians? Do you think Paul did well, not I'm know asking, that these people were Christians when he wrote this? He's so they were already Christians, Christians right? right? So I'm talking to someone. If I'm talking to someone who is a Christian, I'm teaching them Scripture. Where this is what God's Word says. Right. What kind of logic would it be to say, well, they're already Christians. Why are you teaching them? Well, my question would be to you, Travis. Then why is Paul writing Christians if we can't read and learn from this? Now, I just want to make it very clear that you said that we're justified after we're baptized. But the Bible is very clear here. And this is just here. Uh -huh. And you think that this when you when do you come into the blood of Christ? When do you when do you come into the contact of the blood of Christ? You tell me that. OK, you come in contact with the blood of Christ because. Uh, one would know that because the blood of Christ washes away sins. Wouldn't you agree with that? The blood of Christ? Yeah. Okay. So in Acts twenty two sixteen, Ananias, a preacher, told Saul to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that you come in contact with the blood in obedience of being baptized. And then you are justified by faith because baptism is an act of faith. It's a synecdoche. It stands for yeah, part of well, the whole. Well, that's, that's just bad understanding of Acts 22. And I can't wait to go into it, William. That's not when his sins were forgiven. His sins were forgiven way before he got baptized. And I'll show it to you in Scripture because I don't believe the Bible contradicts. But you're going to have some hard times contradicting the Bible. Check this out. What if I showed you this in Romans 3.23? What if I showed you this is where you come into the contact of the blood? It just says it. As clear as a bell. I actually had that on my PowerPoint. So, right. So that's what's shocking to me. Like, what? How do you come into access to the blood of Christ? Go ahead. In Romans For all three, all sin falling short of the glory of God. Yeah. Go ahead. What does it say in verse yeah. twenty-four and twenty-five? It says, "Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is where Trey in Christ Jesus in Christ Jesus." And you couldn't give a verse okay. to get into Christ Jesus. But we'll keep reading. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation. That's the uh, covering, uh, a sacrifice, propitiation. Wouldn't you agree with that? That's the atonement. That's what Christ died for. He took the full wrath of God for yeah. the sins in which he died for. For all the people that he died for, he paid the full wrath of God and was propitiated. So, yeah, God's wrath is satisfied in the sacrifice of Christ. So it says yeah, his blood there. Then what? Through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now it says faith in what his are you blood. Reading? Wait, wait, what are you reading here? What are you where, where what kind of book are you reading? You in King James? Let me get you. Yeah, I'll get the English standard for you. Well we can do actually I had it we another one. But... I have it here. I, I put it in my PowerPoint. I think I use the English standard for you. It's very clear. It says uh let me read it who uh, are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's true. I mean, I don't know what your point was. Like, yes, the redemption is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Like mm -hmm. faith alone. Uh, where do you see faith plus something here? Like this is the, no, the word just... has a definition. Well, well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, like, you don't like the definition. Just say, just say, look, I don't like the words that God used, and I'm going to ask Jesus. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm telling you. Trust in his well, sacrifice and his alone. I actually used the definition. They saw it. You saw it in my presentation, Trey. I used the definition. I used theirs, man. Well, I'm just telling you faith. I mean, people are hearing it. They're listening to you going, faith, man. Faith means faith. Faith means but faith. They're, they're, like, hearing faith means they're hearing you. They're hearing you say faith only, and it doesn't say faith only. I didn't say faith. I just I just read the text, man. I'm I'm speaking where the Bible speaks. I'm silent where it's silent. You're the one who keeps okay. saying alone, alone, alone. I'm just like, man, I don't see anything else there. It says by faith. No, I'm please. trying to ask you. I'm trying to figure out. You just said it doesn't say faith only. So I would agree with you right there. It, That's what you said. You said it doesn't say faith there, only. Would it be faith alone? 
would be faith. So you, you're saying not faith alone. It's faith plus baptism, correct? So Romans so 5, Romans 3 reading. is wrong. Romans 4 is wrong. Romans 5 is wrong. Just, but oh, finally, what do you do with it? Romans, the book of Romans has the baptism three times in chapter 6, and that's it. Like that, that seals the deal, right? It actually has, it starts with obedience. Romans 1 5. Do you believe in the obedience? I'm sorry, you got questions. Never mind. Yeah. But this is what obedient Christians obey. Look, go make disciples, right? Jesus says, go make disciples and do what? Baptize them. Who's them? The disciples. Go baptize them. Okay, are there? And so, okay, when this I'm is what Christians do. Christians okay, obey. Go ahead. Well, here, here's what I'll tell you real quick because we got, I don't know how much time we got left, a few seconds. 40. I want you to remember this. I want 40. Here's the two things. There's, you have religion and you have the gospel, Travis. Religion says this, I obey, therefore I'm accepted. The gospel says I'm accepted, therefore I obey. See, the bad theology that hurts people says this right here. It says, uh, my obedience leads to saving faith. My, my obedience question, produces saving faith, but saving faith produces obedience. Faith produces obedience. Roots, good roots produce good fruit. Go ahead. I'm okay. done with my 20 minute, I guess, because we're okay. A few seconds. Well, I only got four seconds, but I was wondering if you had a question at the very end. It goes by pretty quick. All right, guys. Good stuff. Uh, great cross examination. Appreciate you both for the interaction uh, a good interaction and you guys made it rather easy of uh not having to jump in but with that said we're going to jump into closing remarks five minute closing so everyone in the audience if you have a question get it in because we'll i thought we got two i thought we got two 20 minute question answers uh no it's just one each buddy what? <laughs> one I each we had two. yeah yeah, it's just one each. We have we agreed to a forty minute cross examination total. It was twenty oh, minutes each. I had a lot more to go. I was holding back on here. No. Oh. All right, go ahead. Well, All right. you can uh, always go ahead. Uh, that, Are we going to do the question and answers for from the viewers? Yeah, we're going to do that after the closing remarks. Okay. Yep. Trey, you was going to go first. Yes. Um, well, well, so here you got, um, uh, I was wanting to really get into Acts 22. Um, and I can't even fix all my, my slides here cause everything got jacked up. But if you go to Acts 22, you see Paul's conversion, which he wants to say that, um, you know, is, uh, you know, wash away your sins. And I says, wash away your sins. But if you go to Acts nine here, this is what it says here in nine. I'm not going to, um, let's see here. It's Acts 9 where Jesus says, listen, he tells Ananias, Ananias, uh, go down to Straight Street. You're going to see a guy named from, you know, Saul from Tarsus there. And, you know, look, he's praying to me and I have heard his prayers and I'm giving him a vision that you are coming to open his eyes. I'm trying to work on my computer as I talk. You're going to open his eyes, okay, Ananias, because he's praying to me. I hear his prayers. I'm giving you a vision. This is in Acts chapter 9. And what Ananias was sent to do was open the eyes of Paul. Well, we read in John 9, 31, that we know that God does not listen to sinners, but to anyone who is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. See, the reason why Jesus Christ is hearing the prayers of Saul, of Paul, is because his sins are already forgiven. And if you look right here in Proverbs 15, 29, the Lord is far from the wicked. But he hears the prayers of the righteous. This is why Paul would go on to say that the righteous live by faith. See, his sins were already forgiven or else the Bible contradicts. The, and I don't believe anybody's going to say the Bible contradicts here in Psalm 66. It says, come and hear all you who fear God. And I will tell what you what he's done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth and high praise was on my tongue. And if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have heard. See, he, he doesn't. It's just Paul's sins were forgiven. He was not sent to tell Paul how to get his sins washed away. That's just the response that Christians do. Go make disciples, baptize them. I also want to say this right here is, you know, when you look at Cornelius, he was a worshiper of God. Go check out Cornelius in 10 to Acts 10 to he was a God fearer all throughout the Old Testament. God fears were considered regenerate people. They were the followers of God and he was a God fearer. And then you go to 2 Timothy 2.10. 
Second Timothy 2.10. Let's look at this. I got a little time here. This is amazing. I wish. I thought we had 20 more minutes. Where This is where Paul says, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they may obtain their salvation. And then you go to verse 19 there. In 2 Timothy 2. Uh, but God's firm foundation stands, bearing the seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. The Lord knows who are his. So Cornelius was a worshiper of God. Isn't it convenient that he sent someone there to share the gospel with him? And then the Lord knows who are his. For the sake of the elect, he's going to do everything to, so they can obtain their salvation, right? Is what Paul tells Timothy. And then you get over to Acts 16. It says the Holy Spirit forbid them to go over here to share the gospel in Asia. And then Jesus Christ forbid them to go share the gospel over here. But he sent them to Macedonia. And they meet a lady named, I don't know, Lydia. And God opened her heart. And she became the first convert of Philippi. And then you get a letter later on with uh, Philippians. So God's awesome power working. He, he's going to get his people for who he died for. I mean, this is his people. And so this is what we do. We share the message with everybody. He who has ears, let him hear. When Jesus preached and said these things, he who has ears, let him hear. He didn't talk to a big crowd full of people with half of them had ears and half of them didn't have ears. He said, look, you know who I'm talking to. So I'm talking to you in the church of Christ, y'all. I'm telling you, it's sad. Read John 20. I thought we had way more time. Read John 20, verses 30 through 31. This is why I wasn't going to let Travis do that, but I thought we had another round to go. John the Apostle writes this book in 90 AD, 57 years after the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection. And he says, the reason this book was written, he says, I write these things down so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing, you may have life in his name. You have life in his name by believing. But yet, Travis doesn't believe that. Travis doesn't believe the number one verse in the Bible that everybody knows, John 3, 16, doesn't believe that. No. So he doesn't believe the words of Christ apply to us. This is a serious deal. And I wanted, I thought we had another 20 minutes to really go down deep in that, is that's what I really wanted to show you, that he doesn't believe the word of God. Um, so, you know, the Old Testament says that the Old Testament doesn't apply to us. It doesn't have authority over us. Well, you just got rid of 90% of God's revelation of who he is and who you are. And so, guys, I just pray you study your word. Don't just listen to me. Don't listen to Travis. Don't listen to whoever it is. Study your word. Find people, like ask questions. Find people you can ask questions with and not argue and not feel shamed or shunned that you're asking them questions. No one's above anybody else. Like, I love it when people ask me questions. I love it. And so, and I love having friends and people I know that I can talk to and ask hard questions. Love you guys. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. Thank you so much, Trey, for the closing statement. All right. Uh, Travis, you're up for your five-minute closing. I'll start the time when you begin to speak. All right, 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, friends. Go back and watch my uh, 10 minutes I started out. I showed we're justified by faith, grace, the blood, works, by the name or in the name of the Lord and the spirit of Jesus, by Christ, and even by knowledge. And so that's that's very clear that the Bible, this is this is the problem with Trey. Trey reads uh, like Romans 1, 5, but he skips Romans 6, or he skips Acts 22, 16. He explains it away. Friends, I'm just trying to show you that the Bible is so clear about baptism being required. Look, look you just have to explain that away. And now why tarest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's where you uh, contact that precious blood of Jesus, and you're saved by grace through faith. What kind of faith? A faith that obeys, obedience is required. Whatever God says that is required to be saved, you have to do it. You have to obey God. See, that's the thing. I'm on here, I'm on here telling you and showing you from the Bible that you have to obey God. And what he says to do, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that disobey him, right? Is that what Trey would want to say? You have to disobey God when he says to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And again, I want to show you too that when he was talking about his church was in the Bible. Now, 
People get upset, but look, the church is a Christ in here. I'm a member of the church of Christ that you read about in the Bible, okay? I, I believe the Bible is a, the inspired word of God, and when you call my program, you will be treated nice as long as you are nice to me. Now, that I mean, we have to be fair. If you're going to ask me questions and you're trying to trap me like some of the Calvinists, I'm going to get to ask you questions. And you're going to turn around and admit that some innocent babies are going to burn in hell because you believe Calvinist doctrine. You go back and listen to what they say. And Trace is going to have to talk with uh, Matt Slick and Jeremiah because Trace said, I, I could be one of the elect, but I'm not saved right now. But now if you go back and watch my programs, I played Matt Slick when I debated him, and he says, I don't know if I'm saved right now. He says, I might later on get out of it and demonstrate that I was actually elect the whole time. So that's what you're getting. You're getting double talk with these guys. Now, I love Trey, and I want him to go to heaven, but if he continues to be, disobey God, be disobedient, he's leading his family astray, he's supposed to be the head of the household, he needs to get serious and really get into the Word of God. And he went and was taught some by uh, denominations, and he got brainwashed into this Calvinist stuff. And he needs to really, really think about uh, being obedient to the gospel. I asked him about Acts 2.38. He never explained, tried to explain away uh, the four. It's so simple. I'm glad he didn't, of course. Maybe he believes it. You think uh, you guys tune in and see when we do a review about some of the stuff. And even, even when I asked him about uh, being saved there in Romans by faith, I said, doesn't say faith only. I kept on, and he finally admitted. He says, it doesn't say faith only. Well, good. What are you doing teaching faith only? It's not in there. And again, don't use such uh, lack of biblical hermeneutics of how we get authority and only stick your passage out and say, well, there, there's faith. Is that how we actually understand the Bible? What about all the other passages? We see he did that, if I have time here, in 1 John 1, whoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born, and everyone that loveth him, that begot him, um, also that is begotten of him. So believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. Well, I mean, when we go to uh, chapter 2 here, do we just throw out chapter 2, uh, verse 29 right here? Or do we believe that? If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth, doeth righteousness, there's again, you're doing something, is born of him. And again, in uh, 229, about uh, confessing, maybe I miswrote that down, that we have to, everyone that is born of God will confess him. In um, chapter 4, verse 7 here, does he throw these out? Beloved, let, let us love one another, for love is God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. So you got to love. See, he would say that's a gr different Greek word than believeth. That's my time. All right. Thank you guys for the closing remarks. Appreciate you. Let me get us all back up here so we can go through this Q&A. And uh, Travis, if you want to stop sharing your screen. And we can get this thing going. Oh, yeah. All there right. Go. Yep. Good stuff. Thank you guys once again. Uh, fantastic debate. Uh, you guys are we're interacting very well. And I think the audience really appreciate it. So we're going to jump into this uh, super chat. And Mr. Adam Carmichael is a TGT member. And he gets first dibs at the question. Thank you so much for your continued support, Adam. Travis, according, oh, let me throw the rules out there for the, uh, the Q&A. Both of you guys get one minute each to respond to the question. No barking back and forth. Just answer the question. That's all we're doing here, all right? Uh, Travis, according okay. to the fruit of the spirit, pistis, faith, is a fruit. How can people without the Holy Spirit have this faith that is from the Holy Spirit? Thoughts, Trey. Guess his question oh, for Travis. Travis. Yeah, he said Travis yeah. first, and I'm sure he you'll you'll get a chance to get your thoughts. I think that's what he's implying. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Travis. How can one uh, let's see people without the Holy? Let's see how can people without the Holy Spirit have 
this faith. Well, I never said that we don't have the Holy Spirit, so I don't really understand why that, but if he wants to actually call my program, he can ask it, and I'll show him in the Bible. Uh, but every Christian has the Holy Spirit, so I don't understand why he would assume that I don't have the Holy Spirit. All right. Uh, uh, Trey? Is my mic on? It is. Uh, Travis, I'm pretty sure I've heard you talk about that you that the Holy Spirit does not dwell in you. That You think the Holy Spirit is the Bible, though, correct? Or am I wrong? I mean, correct no. me if I'm wrong, but... No, uh, I mean, I never said that the Holy Spirit is actually this paper that's wrote down here. You know, but Do you think the Holy Spirit said, indwells? This, it, this, right. this right. is so, the So, Trey, if you don't mind... Okay, so the, the Q&A, you guys are just interacting with the question. You guys aren't going back at each other. So, uh, so Travis, Trey, you responded. Trey, so, Trey, if you can go ahead and just respond to the question. Okay, I'm trying to look for the question again. Okay, uh, According to the fruit of the Spirit, Pisces faith is a fruit. How can people without the Holy Spirit have this faith that is from the Holy Spirit? Uh, I totally agree because faith is a gift in the Holy Spirit, right? So this goes back to what uh, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about in John 3, being born of water and the Spirit. And this is the thing is in John 3, if you read it, Jesus says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you're the teacher of Israel and you don't understand what I'm talking about? You should know this. And what did Nicodemus teach from? He didn't teach from the book of Acts. He taught from the Old Testament. And if you read in Ezekiel 36, it talks about how God is going to sprinkle you clean water, uh, rid you of all your idols, and he's going to put his spirit in you and cause you to obey him and follow his statutes. That is the gift of God. God does that. God does. You know what God does? He's in the business of raising dead things to life, whether it be your marriage, whether it be your eternal soul, whatever it is, God raises dead things to life. And so when you were dead in your spiritual dead self, you weren't spiritually sick, you were spiritually dead. He put his spirit in you and he caused you. He took out your heart of stone, gave you a heart of flesh. Thank God Almighty that we've been saved by grace alone. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. If you don't believe it, don't sing it. All right. And we have another question here from everyone's favorite watchdog. The dog, Mr. Jeremiah Nortier. What's up, buddy? Uh -oh. Thank you for the super chat. Appreciate you. Uh, question from Jeremiah Travis. Can you explain to me the grammatical historical method of interpretation? Dre, thoughts? The gr grammatical yeah, historical I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. You, you answered the last one. Travis, you answered the last okay. one first. I'll go ahead and get it. This is what a good proper hermeneutic is. It's a grammatical historical and so what we take, what we mean is we take the grammar, we see it, we take context, not just, we look at like the historical context, the grammatical historical of what was going on in this time. What did they understand? What was it that Nicodemus should have understood? Just look at that in John 3. When Jesus says to, John, to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you're the teacher of Israel. How do you not understand being born of water and the spirit? What have you been studying? You are the teacher of Israel. Well, in the context, we have to say, okay, what is it that Nicodemus should have known? Oh, the Old Testament, not the baptism of Jesus, because here's what the Church of Christ did. This is what we did, and this is what I used to do. We would tell people the thief on the cross, the reason Jesus didn't say anything to the thief on the cross is because he was about to die, and he, he didn't have to be baptized yet. How could you be baptized into the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus when he ain't died yet? But yet we're telling people on the front end of his ministry, he's telling Nicodemus that. So he's not telling him an hour before he dies, but he's telling him three years before he dies like that just doesn't even mm -hmm. it just contradicts itself right there so context grammar definitions of words historical context and they take a, a total they take a you, okay. you go ahead and tell them travis your, your approach okay Gr grammatical historical method of interpretation would like hermeneutics the, the study of how we uh, understand the bible you do one of the key things is you would separate the Hebrew, Aramaic, uh, and the Greek, the original languages, along with the immediate context, the overall context, maybe of a book, an area, you would look at, like Trey said, he, he says it, but I don't think he quite understands it, like John 3 about Nicodemus, about being born of water and the Spirit, and you would look at that time frame. No one thought that water was ambionic fluid. That came way later. See, that's the problem with a I lot of people that. when they... They, uh, but a lot, you don't hold that view. You don't think it's ambiotic fluid. I didn't say, did you, uh, we'll go back. When you do your review of this video, you won't yeah. even say it. You'll hear I said Ezekiel 36. But John 3, 5, the water, do you believe that's ambiotic fluid? I'm saying it's what God does. He cleanses us 
he does it all. Okay. It's not talking about baptism. It's talking okay. about all what right. God does in Ezekiel 36, what Nicodemus should have known. That's the context. Okay. He wouldn't answer a little simple question. But anyways. Um, Just because you don't like the answer doesn't mean I didn't answer, Travis. Okay. And uh, so you would look at that, and that's how you would in, uh, study and, and interpret the Bible. It does, scripture doesn't contradict itself. Paul and James doesn't contradict faith and works. You guys just don't know how to make them fit in together. All right. And here's another super chat here. Thank you so much for the super chat, Jamie, for the support. Doesn't say who the question is for, but what is the law of sin and death and not under the law mean? Okay. So... I guess, Travis, you want to go first? Uh, let me see if I can find, remember the reference exactly where he, he didn't put that scripture reference up there. I know, I, I want to think it's in Romans. Do you guys remember exactly? Because I want to yeah. read it. Huh? Romans 8, 1 through 11. Is that it? And Christ be in you, and the body is dead. Let's see what the Spirit is. Uh... That's not it. At least what I'm reading. So what is the law of sin and death? Um... Romans 8, 1 and 2. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, That's weakened by the flesh, that. could not do. Yeah, go ahead. So what is the law of sin and death? Well, in Romans 8, it says, There is therefore now now no condemnation to them that are in Christ uh, Jesus. So it's in a location. You have to be in Christ to not be condemned. That's the state of being lost. Who walk not after the flesh. So you're not walking after the flesh. Well, Romans 8 uh, can very well mean the flesh is connected to the uh, Romans 7.23, but I see another law of my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is on my members. So when you start out with Romans 7, uh, 1 through 4, it's referring to the law of Moses. That was the big thing they had back then. They kept wanting to follow the law of Moses, and Trey actually was making a reference to the Old Testament. So I don't know if he's trying to be justified by the law of Moses. Um but that's what I would say it is. The law of sin and death would be the law of Moses or the works of the law of Moses or just sin in general. All right. Uh, Trey, did you respond yet? No, I'm not. All Let right, just, you got uh, it. I'll say what, um, what Travis doesn't understand. He doesn't understand the atonement of Jesus Christ. And I don't even think he understands exactly why he came. He's not a reset button. He's a savior. He lived a life that you could not live. He lived a life for us. He lived a life in likeness of sinful flesh for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law, all right, might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Because see, but you keep on reading there. I could get in a lot deeper stuff there. But let me tell you something, Travis. In Romans 3, 31, it says, do we then overthrow the law by this faith that we have in Jesus? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. You know, see, in, in our sin, we looked at the law and we, we felt the weight of it. And we said, oh my goodness, I can't do it. I keep failing, I keep failing, I keep failing. But when we look to Christ, Travis, when you look to Christ who fulfilled the law perfectly for you, he crossed every T, dotted every I, lived it perfectly on our behalf. And he took the propitiation of God. He was the propitiation, right? Took the wrath of God that we deserved. And we looked at him and him alone. Then he starts conforming us more into his image. We look to him, not the law anymore, but by looking at him who fulfilled the law perfectly, guess what he does when he's conforming us into the image of himself? We start following the law, not even trying to follow the law because the law what? was fulfilled in Christ. He was the fulfillment of it. That's why the law is perfect, holy, and good. It's, it shows you a picture of who God is. He's holy. It's, he's good. He says, and well, now we look at the law. Guy, and say, oh, what a beautiful okay. Thing. All right. So can I elaborate there, on the end of that? Can I, can no, I elaborate? No, we can't. Can no, we can't. Uh, no, I, we, Okay. We you already responded. Well. Okay. Yeah, you, you already responded. Trey already responded. So we'll go to the next. We're trying to, the whole idea of me being real strict is trying to smash through as many questions as we can in the limited time. You. All right. So uh, we have another super chat here. We're coming from Cameron. 
I'm gonna try to say your last name, Cameron Vogelsang. Vogelsang. I probably destroyed it. <laughs> but other than this, Cameron, thank you for the super super chat. Thank you for the support. For Travis, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, must one say the words, quote, Jesus is Lord to be saved? If so, what about people who can speak and qualify and qualify the exception? Okay. Well, he's actually the individual who had called in my show and I asked him about Romans 10, 9 and 10 and Matthew 10 32 so now he's trying to make up excuses about what if people can't speak well what if people can't hear how are they going to hear the gospel what about if a person has no legs uh, to walk to get baptized we can come up with what if but I think the person if he can't speak and you say do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God can he shake his head can he give some kind of sign of language? But that's a lot better than saying you don't have to say if nothing's wrong with you and you, you don't have to say that Jesus is Lord with your mouth because you would work your way to heaven. That's a big difference. And this is the guy that called the show that I would be embarrassed too to uh, contradict Matthew 10, 32 and Romans 10, 9 and 10. All right. Trey? Yeah, the word, the Greek word there means to commit oneself to do something for someone, promise, assure, to share a common view. It's a being of one mind. That's what the Greek word there is. And so it's just what word? What, what Travis has in the church, in the church of Christ, it's a legalistic, it's, it's a, let me put it this way, it's a literalistic reading of scripture. If it says it, it means it. That's what it says. That's what it means. Well, that's a very literalistic way. That's not a literal way. A literal interpretation of scripture takes into context and, and those things. And so, and I've talked to Travis like this before on a, on a chat before we were back and forth. He was asking me some questions and I was showing him how he has a literalistic view of scripture, not a literal view of scripture. Now you have to say literal, but it's not. And this is why he holds people to the fire. Like, oh, you got to confess. You've got to say, you've got to say it. If you don't say it, man, like exactly. What if you're mute? What if you can't? And God, I mean, it's either this way or that way, right? He shows no favoritism, right, Travis? So you can't say yes for this one, but well, this one, God's the one that makes them mute. That's what it says in the Bible. God makes them mute. He's the one that makes them deaf because he's sovereign God. He's good. What about people who can? What about people who can confess? I mean, right. can well, Cameron yeah, confess? Means, share a common view yeah. of one mind. That's what it means. All right, guys. Let's uh, go to the next question here. Another super chat. Thank you so much for the super chat. It's for you again, Travis, man. They're coming at you, man. Can he identify or affirm anyone as Christian between after the Bible was written and the year 1800? Uh, well, I mean, this person may be the ones that call my program, and I, I wish you guys would call, but I actually believe the Bible is sufficient. So if you want me to go back and dig up some history um, in uh, 1600s or something like that, I might not be able to find that, but... Uh, let me pull up. Well, if you if you call my program, I've got it right here saved. Some individuals around two or three hundred A.D. and they were Christians. Some what we would call the early church fathers taught baptism. They believed in the Church of Christ. They took the Lord's Supper. So though that would be my answer, but again, I don't know why the Bible isn't sufficient. All right, uh, Trey. Yeah, yeah, history or history is a, a stubborn thing, right? I mean, facts are stubborn things. I mean, we can look it up. We know that Alexander and Thomas Campbell and Barton Stone uh, started the Church of Christ movement around 1811. I mean, I'm looking at a document here, man. Just FaceTime. I mean, Facebook message me, and I'll send you some of the some really good stuff here. Um, yeah, so I don't know what to tell you. I mean, they would say that the church went apostate. So would Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh Day Adventists. That's why it's called the Restoration Movement. It, it came to restore the one true church. This is why every one of those groups think they're the only ones going to heaven uh, because they're the ones that restored the one true church, right? But what you're saying by that is, well, Jesus didn't keep his word. He is not the good shepherd. He let his sheep go astray. He's not the good bridegroom because he, he abandoned his bride for a long, long time. It's the restoration movement. It's not not good company you're in there. All That's right. just facts. I mean, this, you study it yourself. And here's another super chat. Thank you again. You guys are really supporting. Appreciate it. 
Another question for Travis. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 17. If baptism is necessary for salvation, then how can Paul separate baptism from the gospel? Okay. So uh, again, you don't want to be like Trey and some of the other Calvinists that pull out one exactly verse and only use verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. You actually want to get into the context, as I said earlier. It starts out, Paul is actually talking to uh, Corinthians, the members of the church of Christ, and he tells them in verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Let's keep reading. Let's go down to 12 for time. Now this I say that every one of you say, I'm a Paul, I'm a Paulus, and I'm a Cephas, and, uh, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Now, to be a disciple, to be a Christian, he tells them in verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? So I would ask this person, Josh, do you have to have uh, Jesus crucified for you? He would say yes. Notice what Paul says. He says, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So to be a Christian, you actually have to be baptized in the name of someone. And we understand that is in the name of Jesus. And again, he tells them in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, uh, for by one spirit, you're all baptized into one body. And so that would be my answer that actually that verse teaches baptism. It is an argument for baptism because you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. All right, Trey. Yeah. Man, great question. Uh, this starts off in Acts 18 where Paul is trying to run away for his life, but then all of a sudden Jesus gives him a vision and says, listen, buddy, don't leave. No one's going to harm you. No one's going to hurt you. Stay here because I have many people who are mine in this city. Question, how did Jesus know he had many people in the city who were his? Another question, how could he promise no one would harm him when their own free will wanted to kill Paul? Because Jesus has authority over all flesh, and he gives eternal life to all those that the Father has given him. That's in John 17 verse 2. But then we turn to Corinthians 1. I think it's very interesting that the greatest missionary that the church has ever known, Paul, didn't go around baptizing people. He says in Corinth when he stayed there a year and a half, Acts 18, he baptized three, maybe four people. He's like, I don't even know. But I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you. But then we get to chapter 4 and he says this in verse 15. For though you have countless gods in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became, I, Paul, became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Not through baptism, but through the preaching of the word and then believing it. Because he didn't baptize them. He only baptized like three or four of them is what he says. Right? So how did he become the father? What are you a father of? A child, something reborn, something born. And so these people in Corinth that he stayed a year and a half, that he only baptized three or four of them, he is their father in the faith. Why? Because he preached the gospel. Because he didn't come to baptize. He came to preach and for those to believe in Christ by faith alone, in Christ alone. All right. And here's... Another super chat from Cameron. Thank you so much, Cameron. And he got another question for you, Travis. Travis, you made a huge deal of faith alone not being in the Bible. Do you believe in the Trinity? If so, where does the Bible use the word Trinity? Okay, well, uh, again, he tried to actually use this argument on the call. You guys should actually subscribe to Truth and Proof, and you can call in and talk to me live. We'll put the Bible up there. But... Uh, I actually did a lesson on what he would say, the Trinity, and I used the word Godhead because the Father and Son and Holy Spirit is the Godhead. They make up the Godhead. So, uh, Cameron, I really don't use the word Trinity. I try to stick to the Bible, and if you go watch my lesson, I used Godhead. And again, Trey said faith only wasn't in there, so I don't know, Cameron, why you're believing faith only anymore. All right, Trey. Yeah. Um, I'm looking here in concordance and I don't see where Godhead's used in the Bible either. Um, you have three references mentioning about God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and different things, but that word Godhead's not either, either. So I don't know what his argument right there was, Travis. Uh, also the Bible itself, that word Bible is not in the Bible. So this is the problem when you, when you deal with people who are legalistic and just hold you to the fire over one little thing, because they don't want the context. I just always tell people you fight legalism with legalism and they can't hold up to their own standard. Um, like, you know, he's using pieces of the book of John and Matthew and Mark. He doesn't even believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have any application to us other than the parts that he wants. Like John 3, 16 doesn't apply. What he says to Mary and Martha, when he says, Martha, whoever believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? What's well, a good question for Travis too. Do you believe that? Do you believe that whoever believes in Jesus Christ 
will never die. No, he doesn't believe it. But he'll believe some parts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Man, it's just a, it's a very sad thing. It breaks my heart. I'm telling you, I believed it with all my heart. Travis, I was there. I was you times 10, times 10. But I want you to come to know Christ. He is the author and perfecter of your faith, not the co-author. Okay. All right. A uh, couple more questions and we'll shut this thing down. Trey, this is for you. Finally, a question for Trey. St. James used two examples to prove were justified by works, Abraham and Rahab. These examples are also used in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. Does this mean these works are really faith? Hebrews 11, I was hoping to get to here and I was hoping to get to James 2. I thought we had 40 more minutes to go. But James 11, you got to read it slowly. It starts with like this. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. This is not, it's not evidence. It's, it's evidence of things not seen. Whatever word you want to use, it's not seen. I can see Abraham doing this. I can see people doing that. Then verse 2, for by it, by what? Faith. The people of old received their commendation, their approval. That word means approval, acceptance of God right there. That's how they were saved. And because you go down to verse 11, people want to look at all the doing, 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 because it makes sense in our flesh. Like something that good of grace that I don't deserve, I get it for free, that doesn't make sense. I've got to do something. Well, look at what Sarah did. Sarah did nothing. Look in verse 11 here. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. I just want to finish this real quick with Romans 4. It's the same thing Abraham did. You want to know how Abraham was justified? Now you can go right, right here. I'm going to read it real quick. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That's why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. That's why. It says that is why. Why? Because he was fully convinced. The same thing as Sarah. And so when we proof text, we're just pulling things out. We got to take the whole Bible. What is this saying to us? And this is how we are justified as well, by faith, fully convinced that Christ, God Almighty, can do what he promised. Travis? Elaborate. All right, St. James uses two examples to prove we're justified by works. Well, in James 2, 14, it is talking about salvation. He says, what doth it profit, my brother, though a man say he has faith and have not works, can faith save him? And then he goes on to show in verse uh, 19, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Uh, they even actually confess, uh, Matthew 8, 29, the devils do. But wilt thou know of... Oh man, that faith without works is dead. So therefore, we see that works is required according to James. And then he says in verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled, what saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. You see that how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Um, let's see. There we go. Verse 21. I'm sorry, I missed that one. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered up his son upon his son upon the altar? Well, Trey, if you actually do a study of, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the guy that put the comment. I thought his name was Trey. Who's the person that? Oh, he's saying Trey. He's asking Trey. Never mind. Right. Um, if you study just real quick, if you study about Abraham, you'll understand that Abraham was justified by faith in Hebrews twelve or Hebrews 11, and then uh, in Genesis 15 is where Romans chapter 4 is taken from, and then along with Genesis 22, 18, because he had obeyed God. And so you see uh, that Abraham was justified by words. All right. First Here John is 2, a... 29, if you know right. that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices right. righteousness has been born of sure. him. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> Y'all some rule violators, yo. <laughs> but it's all good, man. Here, here, here's a, here, here's a, here's another super chat. Thank you, Josh, for the super chat. And he's uh, coming at you again, Travis. Are we justified by faith when we have faith, or when we have faith and get baptized? Okay. Um, again, I show the Bible teaches that we're justified by faith, but what kind of faith is it? Is it a dead faith or is it a faith that is actually going to obey what God says to do to be saved? So when you guys are reading Romans, Romans, Ephesians, Galatians, you need to actually re read the conversion account like the Corinthians in Acts 18 verse 8, along with the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, along with... Um, 
you have uh, the conversion of Saul. So you have these people who are lost, and you read about how they became Christians. And then one can say that they're justified by faith because they actually obeyed. They actually did what God said to do. So are we justified by faith? Yes. Uh, when we have an obedient faith, not a dead faith, not a faith that's not going to disobey God, because do you throw out the verses that say that to be baptized for the remission of sins, or 1 Peter 3.21, where uh, Peter says baptism saves us, or Galatians 3.26-27, where we're actually uh, baptized into Christ. In Galatians, I, I want to end on this one, because this one, Paul actually uh, uh, tells us about faith. He says, for you are all the children of God by faith. What kind of faith? How is that? Do you not know as many of you have been baptized into Christ? You've put on Christ. So Paul really tells us the type of faith is a faith that obeys. And baptism is when God removes the sins of the flesh. Colossians 2.12, Acts 22.16. All right, Trey. I, what, I, want to do a, I want to do a podcast on all of this stuff real quick. It's just such word judo. I just want everybody to think about this real quick. When he says, well, if you want to understand the epistle. Oh, did I lose Trey? He was predestined to be frozen. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think I lost Trey there. Trey, come on back if you're listening, Trey. Uh, come on back. I'll let her hear your response, Trey. There, there he is. Go. He's back. All right. You got me? All you right. Me? Yeah, me? we can hear you. All right, good. So here's why I don't want people to fall for. Don't fall for this junk that the epistles were written to the people who were converted in Acts. As if no one, and, and Acts is the 15th book written. There is 18 years since the first book of the New Testament was written to the book of Acts was Shouldn't written. Shouldn't you answer the okay? question, though? Here's, here's, I'm going to answer the question. Here's the deal. Don't fall for that. And that's why he's interrupting right there, because he knows that is just the most absurd thing to think that all these people that they're writing were the ones who were converted in Acts. It's ridiculous. Like as if there was no one new. So are we justified by faith when we have faith? Yes, you're justified by faith when you have faith. And that's what it says. Romans 5, 1, we stayed there. Travis wants to say, but it's an obedient faith. Well, here's what it says. 1 John 5, 1, everyone who believes that Jesus Christ has been born of God. 1 John 2, 29, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. This is what Christians do. It's the fruit of the faith. The faith produces fruit in you. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. Apart from him, you can do nothing. He does it all through us. He gets all the glory, not us. So it's just an absurd argument to say as if, as if Methodists, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Baptists, whatever, are saying, well, we have faith. We can just do whatever we want. Travis, it's just re it's a ridiculous argument. We love mm -hmm. the things of God. We want to serve God. We look at his law and we say, man, what a beautiful law. And I still fall short, but I look to Christ. I look to Christ because Christ fulfilled the law. I want to be like Christ, not the law. I want to be like Christ. But if I'm like Christ, I'm doing what God has said to do. And that's obedience. This is what all the, the New Testament stuff's about. When you read like James, you read Timothy, all of these little epistles, man, they're great. They're beautiful because it leads to obedience. That's what the Christian does. It's just what they do. It doesn't make you a Christian. It proves you're a Christian. All right. And here's the final question of the super chat. Thank you, Paul, for the super chat. Travis, if faith is a synth, what is that? Synetiki. Yeah. I, sh I should know that. Synetiki. Now, why did Paul exclude circumcision from justification, a part of Abraham's system of faith, as you say to be saved? Okay. Why did Paul, the apostle, exclude circumcision from justification? Well, Paul was dealing with Judaizers uh, that were trying to force uh, converts into being circumcised. In Acts 15, verses 1, uh, if I'm not mistaken, verses 1 and 2, let me turn over there. And this is the problem uh, that they were dealing with throughout pretty much the whole New Testament. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So uh, he's showing a separation that you don't have to be circumcised. And that's the biggest thing in Romans chapter 4, verses 1. Because these people in Romans 3 and 2 were trying to bind circumcision. So what happens is uh, denominationalism takes that argument and they try to put 
baptism in there, and, circum and baptism is not even another subject. It's actually talking about circumcision. And, and that's why Paul uses Abraham to show that he was justified in Genesis 15 before he was circumcised in Genesis 17, but he'd actually already obeyed God in Genesis 12 when he, by faith, left the Ur of the Chaldeans, which would be a work. Could you imagine packing all your stuff up and actually leaving and doing something, what God says to do? But they say, oh, there's no works. There's nothing you can do. So that would be my answer for that. All right, <clears throat> Trey? Yeah. It's so heartbreaking to hear him just keep saying what he's saying. It's just, it, it's heartbreaking. Fully convinced that What's God the, was able to question? do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Because he had faith in Christ. It's like, look, Travis, if you gave me a, a million dollar check, you said, here's a million dollar check. All you got to do is go to the bank and cash it. You know what? I wouldn't do it. You know why? Because I have no faith that you have a million dollars. Now, if Donald Trump gave me a million dollar check and said, go cash it, it's yours, I'd go. You know why? Because I have faith that Donald Trump has a million dollars in the bank. And by faith in Christ, yeah. by faith in God, this is what makes it, this is what pushes us. This is the fuel that pushes us forward to follow and obey him. And this is why Abraham went out. Why? Because his faith that he had, he, he, the promise that he made to Abraham. This is why the gospel was preached to Abraham. The gospel was preached to Abraham. Gen Galatians 3. So he heard the good news. He put his faith in God. And by his faith, he obeyed. All right, I guys. Agree. Good stuff. Good stuff. Appreciate you both for this debate and the interaction. And once again, the audience loved it. And um, any final word? Well, I guess I'll say this. I send out gifts to those who are newcomers on the platform. Uh, just to thank you for meeting you, for taking time out your busy schedule to come on the show. And so I'll be reaching out to you guys to uh, get, get the address and send you the gift. Also, uh, do you guys have any final words before I shut this thing down? Yeah. yeah, you want to give like, want like each of us a minute or something or 30 seconds? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead, Travis. You get it. Okay, that's fine. Uh, how long? Uh, you got 30 seconds to a minute. You got it. Okay. Well, I appreciate you having me on your show. I do appreciate the viewers. Uh, again, it is so hard to convince people being all the way across the, the world or across the country because you actually don't personally know me. You might think that I'm just a jerk. This, you know, you don't really understand that I'm married and have three kids and I preach and I love fishing and I coach soccer and I'm just a real person just like you. But I do believe the Bible is the word of God and I do take this serious. And that's why if you do have further questions, you know, I, I, I would love for you to call in. I don't make any money off my program. My phone number is up there. You can call and, and people will see that we just communicate back and forth and I would love to um, to hear from you guys and I appreciate uh, Trey willing to discuss this I love his soul and um, I, I do think that he was nice to me and I hope that I didn't come across very too rude or something like that because I, I do love um, people's souls I, I want I'm serious about this so so I hope you guys will tune in and, and join to study with me that's all I have to say appreciate you having me on all right. Appreciate yeah. you coming on. What you got, Trey? Man, I just want to say I love the people in the Church of Christ. And I want, you know, I know it, it offends them. It hurts them. And I, I promise you, I, I want them to be freed in Christ and understand what it feels like to be truly free in Christ and not carry this weight of works on you that you know, you're scared if you're going to lose your salvation. Am I good enough? Have I done enough? You haven't done enough. You'll never do enough. But Christ, Almighty God, Christ Jesus did enough. He did it all. Put your faith in him. And Romans 10 just scares me to death. And, you know, Galatians scares me to death for my, my people in the Church of Christ, the whole Galatian heresy. But here in chapter 10, he says, Brothers, my heart's desire goes out to the Israelites that they may be saved, for they have a zeal for God, but it's not based on knowledge. It's not based on the righteousness of God, but it's based on their own righteousness and what they're doing. And that's what, it's, it's a serious thing. Like, Travis, you're saying, like, it is a very serious thing. It is a very serious thing. And, um, and I, I just finished with this, like Paul said, Am I now your enemy because I tell you the truth? Um, I love you guys, um, and just study the word. Don't don't believe me, Travis. Anybody, study your word, ask questions, and if someone is will not sit down with you and ask questions, that should be a red flag to you. So, um, th hey, Marlon, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, appreciate it. Look toward you know look forward to doing some more later down the road. Maybe me and Jeremiah right. can do Travis and his buddy in Reformed theology. 
would be an interesting one. People always like two on two debate. So perhaps that's uh, something to come down, down a pike in the future. But once again, you guys, thank you so much, man. And, um,